昔から流行り廃りてえものがございます神の世もそれは変わらぬようでして昔から流行り廃りというものがございます神様の世もそれは変わらぬようでして流行り廃りてのもございますが変わらねえもんも必要でございます神様の世もそれは変わらぬようでしてリアリズムインストーリーズ is a bit of a funny topic It's often thought that realistic narratives have some sort of inherent leg up on unrealistic ones because they're more relatable by our standards. But in actuality, saying that a story is realistic is just a simple descriptor of approach rather than a compliment. Context is everything, and realism in and of itself is not impressive if the intent and execution of a work don't line up and follow through with quality. However, in the case of a down to earth story whose intention is to provide a heartfelt tale about seeking a place in the world, making existence worthwhile, finding tranquility through human connection, and experiencing joy through interacting with performance and art, realism is absolutely essential to display everything said story needs to display about the human condition. So, when I say that Showa Genroku Rakugo Shinju is among the most genuine, raw, and realistic character pieces I've ever experienced, I mean that as the highest possible compliment. It is a narrative tapestry with nearly unparalleled sophistication. A slow burning, layered, beautifully directed piece that naturally juggles so many perfectly imperfect character journeys and themes that it boggles the mind. Gushing aside, in the broadest terms possible, Rakugo can simply be described as a story that gets down to the heart of what it means to be alive. A celebration, and at times a lamentation, of existence, art, and how those two intertwine. But such a broad topic can only be tackled without feeling unfocused and scattered if a story finds its identity through specific means of presenting its ideas. And Rakugo finds this identity through its character focus, its thoughts on the dichotomy between tradition and progression, its deep musings on the purpose and resonance of art, and how all of these elements interweave so seamlessly. The primary cast of Rakugo are incredibly well realized and brought to life via very consistent characterization, demonstrated through dialogue, visual cues, and behaviors. But there is a surprising amount of subtext that, while insinuated, leaves sizable bits up to viewer interpretation. Note that the following is simply my take on things. It is backed up by logic and what is given within the story, and it is what I believe to be the most fitting interpretation of each character, but some of it is not confirmed fact. However, despite this, I find that a great deal of this interpretation forms a very cohesive picture, one that ultimately lands on a very personal, poignant point that we all just want to live a life worth living. A life of love for what you do, a life for art, for others. And for yourself. Bold, free, and larger than life, Sukiroku distinguishes himself as a representation of unfettered passion and exuberance. In relation to Rakugo, this translates to a style of almost innate attractiveness and magnetism. Sukiroku performs for the audience, for them to laugh, cry, and find escapism and fulfillment in these stories, and his natural charisma complements this intent perfectly. Rough around the edges as he is, and as difficult and undisciplined as he tended to be, his art was one of pure, unrestricted joy, and that is something that strikes a unique chord with people. With an unrelenting passion for Rakugo, Sukuroku wanted to ensure its survival through a promise with Yakumo, who I'll discuss in a bit. That their differing styles would be two halves of a whole to carry Rakugo into the future. That Yakumo would maintain the traditional roots of the art, and that Sukuroku would keep it dynamic and adaptable to be able to make sure it stays contemporary and relevant to current audiences. Because according to him, An established art must have both aspects to persevere culture and progression. He looked towards this goal with wide eyed optimism, 
As stated by Yakumo, wherever Sukuroku looked, he saw a bright future, sometimes foolishly and sometimes stubbornly. And he carried this with him throughout his life. But unfortunately, his fire burnt a bit too bright and he found himself ill-equipped to deal with true responsibility. Unable to see clearly until it was too late to stop what had already been put into motion. Having convinced himself that he could blow through life like a hurricane, he never really got himself together. Not being able to pursue Rakugo in the way he wanted to, to be as good as he could have been to his woman, to be an ideal father, and to simply live a life of utmost value. His daughter Konatsu is clearly loved and doted upon, but she has enormous and disproportionate responsibility for such a young girl. It's clear that Tsukidoku is full of love, but just too reckless and irresponsible to express that love in a tangible way apart from sentiment, memories, and affection. He's a lazy layabout, and that was not good enough. He was a man of unparalleled charisma, but he simply burnt himself out due to his slowly self-destructive tendencies. Miyokichi was cursed with a nearly insatiable need for almost disproportionate affection. Perhaps in compensation for the lack of care that she received as a child, we are immediately shown that she is not conservative with her intimacy. Seemingly traveling from suitor to suitor, using them and relying on them for a short period of time but never really getting the emotional security that she so desired from these men. As such, she became a woman who was characterized by sexuality and intimate charm. As these talents were necessary when it came to her trade as a geisha, her yearning for connection, and the very overt insinuations that she had some experience with prostitution. But despite being characterized by this sexuality, it was not a happy place for her, and the men she encountered, the raucous, aggressive, authoritative people that she constantly met, were never what she was looking for in a partner. She desired a contrast, security, levity, and some normalcy. So naturally, when she meets Yakumo, someone entirely unique, she's instantly drawn in by his rawness, independency, and withdrawn nature. He was someone who made her feel completely safe through his reservedness and lack of overt sexuality, and this key difference helped her to fall head over heels in love with him. To her, he represents everything she looks for in a partner, and she pours herself into her relationship with him. And though he undoubtedly reciprocates some affection back, there is a clear imbalance. Because due to both Miyokichi's mentality and Yakumo's state of mind, this relationship was never going to be healthy or functional. Miyokichi is among the most tragic and layered characters in this story, but for the sake of the structure of this video, I'd ask that you just hold this thought before we dive deeper into the nuances that make her so well realized. The main character of Shogun Roku Rakugo Shinju is the thematic and narrative fulcrum, the one element of consistency from which the characters, themes, and even Rakugo itself base themselves off of. Though he is given multiple names throughout the story, I'll be referring to him as Yakumo throughout the video for the sake of consistency, although I've already been doing that. Orphaned, forgotten, and alone, Yakumo was a child of profound sadness prior to the events in the story. Unable to dance due to a bad leg, unable to become a geisha due to his sex, unable to properly execute Rakugo due to a lack of passion and talent, he finds himself to be lost. Stoic and reserved and trapped, on a path that he felt forced onto regardless of his personal wishes. He is aimless. Not sure of where he's headed or what he's doing, feeling completely unloved despite being taken in by a veteran Rakugo master. But all it takes is one tiny nudge, one change of perspective, and one person to make all the difference in situations like these. And as it turns out, this dirty, unruly, undisciplined rascal ended up being exactly that for Yakumo. 
おめえさんも捨てられたんだろう<笑>何があったかわからねえけどつれえやなこの年で一人放り出されるなんてなああうん。Even as a kid, Sukaroku had a habit of speaking uncomfortable truths as if they were nothing. And while this made the pain for Yakumo even more real, it also opened the door for healing and progress. And most importantly, Sukaroku stresses here that Yakumo and him are on the same boat. That both of them are lonely, but due to each other's presence, neither are alone. The two grow and learn the art of Rakugo together, and as the years go by, Yakumo begins to develop some incredibly complex feelings about Sukaroku. It was not a simple relationship, and Yakumo did not hold Sukaroku in totally positive regard, because when you grow up with someone doing the same thing, it is natural for an element of competition or comparison to emerge. And in their early adult years, the gap in talent and quality between the two was immense. Sukaroku was born for the stage with his natural charisma, likability, and knack for understanding what drew people to performance. But Yakumo had none of that, having to work excessively hard and still falling short in comparison. His stories felt forced and unnatural, the strain on him was always clear, and he simply had no idea what his style of Rakugo was. People watched him out of obligation rather than enjoyment. It made him envy and resent Sukaroku. This man who lazed about and hardly practiced was so much better than him because of some unfair gift, seemingly rendering all of Yakumo's hard work irrelevant. But thankfully, this negativity that Yakumo regarded Sukaroku with was easily overpowered by other feelings. Yakumo was often annoyed and frustrated by his partner's laziness and irresponsibility, but it is clear that he valued him comfortably above everything else. Though Yakumo was far from living prosperously at this point, Sukaroku was the one who essentially opened the world up to him, who provided him with laughter and happiness. As such, he felt a unique sort of attraction and gratitude towards him. He doesn't necessarily idealize or romanticize Sukaroku because he is acutely aware of his faults, but in spite of those faults, he considers him to be the most important aspect of his life. Additionally, and perhaps most importantly for the narrative, Sukaroku teaches him to enjoy Rakugo. Through Sukaroku's heartfelt and joyous performances, Yakumo is able to see the beauty of the art, despite not caring for it earlier. In his fledgling years, Rakugo meant anxiety and discomfort for Yakumo, but due to Sukaroku, it also meant fun and happiness. This made it so that Yakumo essentially conflated his passion for the craft and his resentment and love for Sukaroku, making them one and the same. And this is perhaps the most important element of Yakumo's character. This dualistic and very human attitude that he had towards Rakugo helps him realize something. Yakumo greatly misses Rakugo when he is cut off from it after Sukaroku and his master go off to the war. He obviously misses it because of how much he'd grown to enjoy it, but here he is drifting back towards it, as a subconscious yearning to see Sukaroku again. It helps him feel connected to him when they are apart, and this is all he has. So he practices on his own, even though he will feel no joy from the performance. Because it helps him feel close to Sukaroku, and because storytelling has taken root in his heart. As he says, he had grown to need it. And then Sukaroku's return encourages Yakumo to see the world in a way similar to him, as one full of possibility. But soon after the war, Miyokichi enters the picture and her relation with Yakumo begins to bloom. 
As said earlier, she genuinely falls for him, and he does find comfort in Miyokichi as she pours herself into him, adoring him for all that he is despite his insecurities and flaws. But there is still an affection imbalance, the reason for which simply being that Yakumo's head was elsewhere. Because at this time, Yakumo was coming into his own and developing. He had finally found his Rakugo after playing a woman in a play, and this helped him realize that where he excelled was with the body stories, the artistic, provocative ones, often coinciding with female characters. Now that he had found his style, he buried himself in practice to try and refine it. But this was just a feeble front that he put up as a sort of compensation. To truncate this sequence of events, he did not give Miyokichi the love she craved, so she ran into the arms of Tsukuroku in search of someone, anyone, to love her. They run off, it doesn't work out between the two, and they both end up dying, leaving Yakumo with their daughter. It's very clear that this is dysfunctional just from a shallow standpoint, but diving into the nuances of these character dynamics really demonstrates how messed up and flawed these people are. And it's all wonderfully presented. <laughs> In the midst of much friction between Tsukuroku and the men of authority in Rakugo, Yakumo says this line for so many reasons. Because of their promise, because of Tsukuroku's dream to become a new master, because Yakumo knows how much he loves it, and because it feels like the connection between them is severing. As postulated by Shinkoyo in a series of great comments that I will link, the three main characters of season 1 are thoroughly in love with someone who can't properly love them back. Miyokichi needs and loves Yakumo and believes him to be her everything and her salvation in a similar vein to how Yakumo regards Tsukuroku, but Yakumo is not committed to her due to his practice, as I said earlier. However, this practice is simply something to distract himself from the fact that he is a victim of unrequited love. Very little is truly explicit in this story, but I am, and the comments I'm referring to are, convinced that among the litany of feelings Yakumo holds towards Tsukuroku, romantic love was the most prominent. Yakumo loved Tsukuroku, but he did not have his feelings reciprocated in any romantic way as Tsukuroku simply regarded him with platonic love. Now, I said earlier that Rakugo was something of a proxy for Tsukuroku for Yakumo, and this is clearly demonstrated through his increased focus on the craft in his early adulthood. He cannot be with Tsukuroku in the way he desires, so he buries himself in Rakugo, which is sort of like a Tsukuroku replacement to feel closer to him. Note that this is very likely a subconscious thing. And in the meantime, Miyokichi gets shafted. While I personally doubt that she knew about these complicated dynamics revolving around Yakumo's feelings towards Rakugo, she did know that the I need to practice justification was just an excuse, and she definitely noted that Yakumo had an extremely close connection with Tsukuroku, likely more so than he had with her. The poor woman picked the absolute worst type of man to fall for. One who would never give her everything she wanted, one who would never love her as much as she desired due to what Tsukuroku and Rakugo meant to him. And after Yakumo cuts it off with her out of simultaneous respect and self-interest, she naturally drifts to Tsukuroku, partly to get back at Yakumo and maybe in the hopes that he'd get jealous and chase her, and partly because Tsukuroku was someone who was willing to full-heartedly love her in a way that Yakumo couldn't. But as it turned out, Yakumo never chased her, and Tsukuroku was too irresponsible and self-destructive to provide her with the safety and secure love she wanted, never really able to get his life together. He wanted to give her everything, but was ill-equipped to do so, leaving her life in an absolute mess and leaving her with a festering hatred for Rakugo and anything associated with it. The piece I'm referring to puts it beautifully. Miyokichi is left with a child who adores the man who never supported her and loves the art that triggered her downward spiral in the first place, and Konatsu is a constant reminder of her mistakes. So naturally, 
She leaves. She completely breaks down and reverts to prostitution to live and find affection like she did before meeting Yakumo. Miyokichi personifies a lack of self-worth, dependency, and what a life without proper emotional affection can lead to. And so, when she catches wind of Yakumo being in town, her love for him is overtaken by the flip side of passion. Hatred. Hatred for the man that destroyed her. You can tell that she still deeply loves him and has affection for him as she watches his performance, but oftentimes the line between hate and love gets blurred. Simply put, she was left in disarray while Yakumo has become incredibly successful and gotten back with Sukuroku. She's jealous and beyond grief, so her desire to commit a lover's suicide is completely understandable. This was all kicked off by that disproportionate affection and prioritization, and it is why there's such a sad, ominous, haunting air permeating the journey of Miyokichi. Falling so hard for Yakumo meant that she was doomed from the start, and what we see from her in the story is a slow unraveling. Tsukuroku, on the other hand, had finally gotten himself together for the first time in his life at this point, becoming a true professional and showing the start of being an exceptional father, with a little help from Yakumo and his daughter. He had seen what he was missing and knew that he had to be better if he wanted to live a fulfilling rest of his life and if he wanted his daughter to grow up healthy and happy. But it wasn't to be. After Miyokichi makes an attempt to kill Yakumo, she stabs Sukuroku, who had come to break up the squabble, before an enraged Konatsu pushes her mother off of the balcony and Sukuroku dives after her before falling to his death. He was willing to do literally anything to put things right, but his past misgivings ultimately caught up with him in the form of a vengeful Miyokichi before he had a chance to make up for them. Or rather, his way of making up for them was his inability to let Miyokichi die alone here. And obviously, this event had major repercussions. Not just for everyone involved, but for the Rakugo world indirectly through Yakumo. Yakumo's main two reasons for doing Rakugo, enjoyment and connection to Tsukuroku, are at a constant tug of war with regards to which motivation is primary during the series. But after Tsukuroku's death, it is no longer a war, and the connection Rakugo helps Yakumo to feel towards him becomes the primary factor. He still enjoys himself, but there is much more of a notion of him doing it for Tsukuroku to both feel close to his long-lost partner, and to help carry out their promise. It is a tragic and extremely dark concept, but there is even more to it. I was Clearly he believes that he deserves to be living this lonely hell as punishment for what he did to Miyokichi and Tsukuroku. Given how central of a role he has in this tragedy, Yakumo blames himself and is burdened with guilt, constantly seeing these two as ghosts of his past. There are so many things that he thinks he should and could have done to prevent this. Being more respectful of Miyokichi, disciplining Tsukuroku more harshly, maybe even just showing Miyokichi that she mattered to him, maybe even just trying to convince Tsukuroku to stay just that little bit more. As reflective, internalized, and self-critical as he is, Yakumo chooses to not see this as an unfortunate series of events for which blame doesn't really matter, and instead shoulders all of the burden on his own. He tells Konatsu that he did it, sparking her hatred of him, and though he knows that he may not literally have done it, in his mind he is not really lying because he believes that he is to blame. And this eats him alive but he is spurred on by a promise from long ago that has taken root in him. 
Yakumo has it ingrained in his mind that he is to be the one to carry on the traditional aspect of Rakugo as Sukuroku proposed to him, to never change it. Sukuroku was going to be the progression of Rakugo, Yakumo the tradition. But with Sukuroku gone, such a huge void is left that it doesn't feel right to move Rakugo on without the man who said that he would help it move on. As such, Yakumo thinks that Rakugo should die. He doesn't want there to be Rakugo in the world if Sukuroku isn't in it. It's a contradiction. He wants Rakugo to always be relevant because that's what Sukuroku wanted and because it represents Sukuroku to him, but he doesn't want it to be relevant because a world of Rakugo without Sukuroku is blasphemous. He constantly talks about not wanting the craft to become corrupted, and I believe that corruption in his eyes is defined as an art that has left behind tradition that has become unrecognizable from the one that he attributes Sukuroku to. This combination of feelings causes him to accept the Yakumo name and become one of the most powerful people in the Rakugo world. And he chooses that he will decide where Rakugo goes in Sukuroku's honor. He feels so full of pain that he wants to die, quite literally. But he cannot, because he needs to oversee Rakugo's future, to ensure that it dies with him and at the same time, to ensure that it lives on somehow, the ultimate paradox. Later on in his life, Yakumo knows that what he's done to Rakugo is wrong, but his selfishness cannot allow him to do anything else. Deep down, he wants it to live on, but he cannot allow this to happen yet. He wants to fulfill the promise, yet he doesn't. He cannot let go due to his pain. Yakumo is a truly nice man. He obviously has his shortcomings as a person, but there's a reason that so many people describe him as gentle. He's self-interested and craves solace, but that does not mean that he is not a good person, or that he isn't compassionate and kind. He never wanted to become bitter and disillusioned like his master, and he constantly shows understanding and respect for people like the wonderful Matsuda. And along with his guilt, this kindness is another reason why he hides the truth from Konatsu. To protect her. Yakumo carries himself as an isolative, private person, but he doesn't really long to be by himself. His solitude is an emotional one. One where he is alone, but in a crowd. Alone where he can see the effect that he has on others. He truly cannot live without connection, and this is why he has the most fun doing Rakugo in small, intimate venues. The most enjoyment he had in his life was likely when he was making a meager living with Konatsu and Sukuroku, because there, he had everything he needed. His best friend, an audience, and his Rakugo. In the prime of his career and life. This was his peak. Maybe not in terms of performance, but in terms of existence. Because he has a connection to Rakugo that can't ever be broken. But in his later life, it's become hollow and he resents the craft, yet clings onto it like a lifeboat. I but that's why Yotaro is so special, and why he's arguably the second most important character in the story. Because he storms in like a force of nature and breaks up this pattern. Yakumo had been dead set on never accepting apprentices, but he takes Yota in upon request. Why? Well, part of it is that he reminds Yakumo of Sukuroku, embodying that free spirit. But there's something else about him something different, a true dedication and commitment that Sukuroku never had, and something else. In him, Yakumo sees hope for Sukuroku's legacy, a hope to properly carry out the oath that he made to his partner all those years ago. So he agrees to take Yota on, but only if he fulfills three promises. Firstly, he must master all of Yakumo and Sukuroku's Rakugo. Second, he must open the path for new Rakugo, for it to live on, for storytelling to never die. And lastly, Yota must not die before Yakumo. 
It's a challenge of sorts for Yota to ensure that it stays on, a challenge against Yakumo's self-loathing and insecurities. With the possibility of these promises being fulfilled, he believes that he has the potential to die satisfied, which is much more than he believed was possible prior to meeting Yota. But why does he embody a hope for Rakugo? Why specifically does Yakumo see such hope and possibility in this exuberant young man? A great deal of Yota's arc involves a bit of a professional and artistic crisis, where he had a lot of trouble trying to find what his style of Rakugo was. It wasn't the poetic artistry of Yakumo, yet not quite the egoistic fire of Tsukuroku. He struggles to find his identity before finally realizing that his Rakugo is Rakugo itself. At the family event, Yakumo gets Yota to perform Inokori, a story that differs so much from performance to performance because it tends to transmit the spirit of the performer more than any other piece. And this is how Yota finds his Rakugo. <laughs> Yota's Rakugo embodies the story itself. There is no ego, only an accentuation of the stories on display. And through doing this, Yota gets the audience to adore him. And it is this style that Yakumo sensed in him. It is this that allows him to have the potential to carry out the promise. There's tradition, there's progression, and there's all kinds of stories. So, what better way to have stories maintain themselves than through understanding and embodying them to the fullest? Stories are timeless. So, a lack of ego in Rakugo makes Rakugo timeless as well. This is why an understanding of the art and how it can impact people was so important for Yota, and this is what makes him so special. Through accepting this promise and burden, and using his Rakugo to carry the torch for the art, Yota saved Yakumo on that cold and snowy night. He saves his life, his well-being, his guilt, and he was there to save him multiple times again in the years that followed. Yakumo is the story, but Yota is nearly as important because he is the glue that links so many of these narrative elements together in a cohesive and thematically satisfying conclusion. And at this point in time, with Yota's story properly beginning, everything in the show connects, having a thematic and character-based purpose in one form or another. For instance, having grown up with a deep, deep hatred of her mother, Konatsu is terrified of becoming a slave to her blood and being a person even slightly resembling her mother. This puts her at constant odds with her sexuality, in a diametric opposition with how Miyokichi lived her life. And as a natural extension, it makes her afraid of becoming close to people, scared of affection. As a result, she becomes a woman starved of intimate human connection. Ironically, she becomes a lot like her mother due to her attempts of trying not to become her. And I think that says something. The revelation that her son, Shinosuke, is Yakumo's child deepens this dynamic even more. Konatsu sees herself as a slave to her blood and cannot stop from comparing herself to Miyokichi for what she did with Yakumo. In repulsion, she grows even further from intimacy to segregate herself from that side of her family, and as such, she shields herself from becoming close to Yota. But again, Yota helps her break out of this through showing her love and affection and sharing his life with hers, becoming her rock and she eventually realizes that she deserves love. She embraces it. Yota teaches her that she doesn't have to be her mother, that she can love wholeheartedly and embrace that side of life without becoming something she hates. 
Along with this, she sees that people are filled with good and bad, and that maybe Miyokichi wasn't as terrible as her narrowed view made her seem. And in parallel, Konatsu resolves to let Rakugo properly into her life, and she starts performing. Yota helps turn everything around for her, and this is significant symbolically. Yota, being the personification of stories, saves Konatsu and turns her viewpoint around, so if we separate the nuances and human element of Yota's personality for a second, we can see that at a fundamental level, Yota's role in the show displays how stories can save us. Yota provides a way out of closed-in despair and a way forward for Yakumo, Konatsu, and Rakugo itself by embracing life and art. In another characteristic link, Konatsu's inner conflict is in tune with the way that her three predecessors constantly pined after one another in a self-perpetuating, unfulfilling cycle of misery. Sukuroku burnt himself out, Miyokichi was so desperate for affection that she formed very unhealthy relationships and compensated with someone unsuited to her like a parasite as compensation, and Yakumo spent a good portion of his life closed off to his feelings and punishing himself rather than actually living. He performed Rakugo for himself because for him it was a double-edged sword, but his close brushes with death, his loss of the ability to perform, and the emergence of Yota allow him to finally realize that Sukuroku would be happy to see the current state of Rakugo. He sees that maybe he didn't have to close himself off to connection, and even though he spent a great deal of it self-loathing, Maybe his life really was one worth living, due to the love he shared with those around him. And with these realizations, he can finally rest. In the afterlife, the three look back on their lives with an ironic fondness. Miyokichi is glad to be freed from her role as a woman, realizing that she didn't need to latch on to anyone or anything. She sees that she didn't need to rely heavily on someone to be a complete person, and that she has worth. And due to the volatility of dependency, she sees that she should have formed multiple meaningful connections to help her through life instead of focusing on one. Deep down, she loves Konatsu, but she was so burdened by self-loathing and external reliance that she could not show it which was a shame, because her daughter could have been her saving grace. Similarly, Sukuroku reflects on the tragedy with a smile. That's life. It's a shame that he couldn't have been better, and that he made such mistakes, but being human means not getting things the way you want them. And Yakumo finds peace in the company of the ones he loves doing the thing he loves fulfilled in both aspects of his life. They're all so, so fundamentally flawed, and none of the three lived their ideal life. But that's just how it is. Rakugo is a story that focuses on some very complicated character dynamics centered on what these people wanted to do and did on the quest for love. But as seen through Yakumo, Sukuroku, and of course Yota, Love can be expressed aside from this interpersonal way through affection for art. Rakugo is a labor and expression of love, and a great deal of this story involves the direct or indirect passing down of styles and stories. But naturally, in a developing world, the question comes up. What is best for Rakugo's survival? What will allow it to be evergreen? As I mentioned, the story draws its own conclusions, but a closer look at the facets of these conclusions helps to get a little bit of extra substance out of this work. There are three sides to Rakugo in terms of character energy, and how that extrapolates to consequent lifestyle. The first is cold discipline, practice, learned maturity, solace, and peace, as we see in Yakumo. Next would be uncontrollable fiery passion, free spirit, and a lack of discipline, guided by instinct and pleasure, as we see in Tsukuroku. This dichotomy is shown not to be an isolated incident here, but a generational one also seen through the two's master, and how his dynamics with his rival mirrored Yakumo and Sukuroku's. 
clearly these are two defined styles that, through legacy, will always resurface. Now, both of these have their pros, but there are definite cons with radical versions of each. Tsukuroku was a reckless, wild flame that burnt itself out before really fully living life, and despite looking back on his life fondly by the end, Yakumo spent a great deal of it restricting himself, closed off and soul searching. That isn't to say that either is inherently bad, but the story seems to make it clear that the extremes of either are no way to live. A third side, a merger of both, is a clear path to fulfillment. You need spontaneity and order, a synthesis and harmony. And just as there are three sides shown to lifestyle in Rakugo, there are three corresponding sides to performance and art too. Sukuroku, always instinctual, free, unrefined and bolder than life. Yakumo, deliberate performance, refined to an art, unable to tap into the natural charisma of Sukuroku, but still amazing in his own way. And then Yota, something similar in a sense to both, yet entirely different. The story is a constant interaction between these styles. The contrast and duality of maturity and somberness with red hot spirit. It is the refined versus the natural, and these styles will continue to be carried out and passed down through the generations. And Shinosuke has the elements of all sides, very likely being the biological child of Yakumo, while having the blood of Tsukuroku through his mother, and being raised by Yota. As such, Shinosuke is a literal mix of both styles needed to carry on the spirit of Rakugo, and an embodiment of Yota's story-centric focus. A mix of fire, professionalism, and narrative, a perfect candidate to take up the mantle from Yota and further lead Rakugo into the future. Art must evolve but never forget its roots, yet tradition cannot be a shackle for progression. Yakumo tried to kill Rakugo selfishly by sticking to classics and rejecting change due to his complicated motivations, but prior to that, he was doing Rakugo for Tsukuroku and himself for connection, for his own enjoyment, and for his solace primarily. Tsukuroku did it purely for his passion and the audience, giving himself fully to material that suited his strengths, allowing the audience to fall in love with him, and constantly fitting his Rakugo to the environment that he performed in. From the beginning, Yota was neither. He was captivated by the narrative, the experience of wonderful stories that touch lives. As a result, he wasn't interested in such peripheral endeavors, and naturally came to specialize in conveying the soul of the story. Art for art's sake. And that is how it persists. Rakugo is such an important work because, along with being a beautifully presented and written character piece, it communicates why stories and art are such transcendent, important elements of life. In a sort of meta way, it muses upon what people will do to be close to stories, what stories can represent for them, and how they can offer us a reprieve from the tribulations of life, a way to conquer our battles. As I alluded to earlier, to me, Yota is a pseudo-representation of art in our lives for what he does throughout the story. Just like art, he is flawed and unpolished at times, but he lives with his heart on his sleeve and unapologetically carries out his will. And he saves so many of the cast through his unbridled enthusiasm. Konatsu, Yakumo, the gang members, Shinosuke, Higuchi, Rakugo itself. Art is always there to fall back on when things get difficult and support you through the darkness through its empathy, and Yota is too. Combine that with his take on Rakugo, and he is a walking personification of the value of art and storytelling. And given that, his interactions and significance throughout the story are given a different dimension. When it comes to the question of what the purpose of art is, there is no wrong answer. It's for everyone and everything, for the audience, for the artist, and for art itself. 
but without art and stories in the first place, nothing would occur. No enjoyment, no expression. It's why Yota's style of Rakugo strikes a chord just a bit deeper, at least in terms of the prevailing messages of the show, than Yakumo or Sukuroku's. Because just as Yota changed and carried on the Rakugo craft, the greatest strength of stories is the nature of stories. Art is a means of expressing the ugliness and beauty of life, and through stories we can forget about our worries, focus on something beautiful or revelatory for a little while, and continue appreciating existence as best we can. And that's why stories will never die. We will keep coming back to understand the tragedy of someone like Miyokichi, the vibrant attractiveness of those like Sukuroku, the agonizing solace of someone like Yakumo. And it didn't end well for all three of them, but that's life. And learning from them and indulging in the times where they were happy, that's a big part of where narrative value lies. If you'll forgive me for getting a little personal here, Rakugo hit home for me specifically because of the journeys of the three main performers and why they performed Rakugo. I do do this YouTube thing for myself as Yakumo did, and I do do this for you guys as Sukuroku did, but Yota's motivations truly spoke to me. I think of these videos as a conduit to try and accentuate the characters, themes, and stories that I cover. My goal is to live and breathe the topics of each video, to convey the story in a way that allows its strengths to shine brighter than ever, to allow the story to speak for itself through me speaking about it. I don't always achieve this, but it has been my utmost goal for a while now, and I'm doing my best to achieve this with each video. I can only hope that this intent shines through. Stories are there for the writer and the audience, but they speak louder than any person can tell them and any audience can receive them. They provoke emotional responses that mean so much and can't be put into words, and while this is something that I always sort of knew, the way Rakugo executed it really made that message much more powerful and shaped certain aspects of my life. Above all, that is probably the prevailing idea that I took away from this wonderful story, and I can only hope that it's had a similar impact on you. Many thanks for watching this, and please feel free to share any and all thoughts. あたしも一つだけ聞いていいかい。へい。お前さん、何のために落語をやるんだい。へい、それも落語のためです。